The opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Cable 14, its sponsors or its shareholders, Kojiko Cable, Shaw Cable and Source Cable Limited. Welcome to Council Edition for Wednesday, October the 31st. I'm Doug Faraway. On today's show, the latest on the casino debate, naming rights on everything owned by the citizens of Hamilton, and what's this? Renegotiate the lease at LaSalle Park? Our guest is Ward 6 Councillor Tom Jackson. It's good to have you back under our new format. Doug, good to be back. It's been a few months. Nice to be here. Thank you. Let's begin with the uh, morning headline in the local daily, and that's LaSalle Park. Uh, and just a little background, folks, it's a property purchased by Hamilton way back in 1915. Burlington was just a little entity at that time. It was leased to Burlington for a dollar a year back in 1983. Now there is a movement to re-examine that deal, which still has 10 more years to run on it. Is this a worthwhile exercise or is it fraught with pitfalls, sir? Well, Doug, I think, um, we, first of all, we do have a, a Bay Area committee uh, that's already uh, in play. Uh, several of my colleagues, along with several colleagues from the Burlington City Council, are working on issues of mutual interests and cooperation. And so one of my colleagues happened to recently say that, uh, you know, they're, uh, theoretically, it seems to be an imbalance here in terms of this uh, very generous deal. Uh, for the city of Burlington and even though there's 10 years to go I think my colleague simply of course Councillor Marula I think he simply wanted to raise the awareness in fact many Hamiltonians uh, were very surprised to to learn this and um, so moving forward it it has been uh, sent to this committee uh, the Bay Area Committee for further uh, discussion and uh, ongoing negotiations. And you know what, we wanna do it as much as possible in a friendly, neighbor, neighborly manner. Um, Burlington cooperates a lot with the city of Hamilton. We have joint marine units. We have, um, uh, they're contributing to a cleanup of our harbor as well through both their city and Halton regional government. And a lot of folks, as you know, historically, Doug, have lived in Burlington, worked in Hamilton, or vice versa. So um, we want to maintain the good set of relationships we have with Burlington. But you know what? Raising the awareness of a buck a year is a great deal for any municipality. It's across the Bay. I'll bet you a lot of Hamiltonians may not even realize, unless they've attended a wedding or a banquet at LaSalle Park in Burlington, where it is. But right across from our West Harbor, where the new Sarkoa restaurant is, you can see it directly across the harbor there. So it's just a matter of moving forward. Uh, what's the best deal for the land? E hypothetically, should the city of Hamilton keep it down the road? I'll bet you an appraisal of that land, Doug, is probably worth multi-millions. And so anyways, it's, uh, it's something to at least uh, begin talks about. In the day when it was purchased, that was the day when people had homes on the beach strip. They had a summer home on the beach strip. Correct. Still a day when even the mountain was a summer home kind of place True. for the for the air. That's why the sanatorium uh, was, was built there. And in the day, it was close to Brown's Wharf, so ferries would have taken Hamiltonians across the LaSalle Park to listen to music, to have a picnic. It would have been pristine country in those days. Correct. But I think I remember as a young reporter covering council in the early 80s, the reason why Hamilton gave it up for a buck was the cost of maintaining LaSalle Park and the buildings on LaSalle Park. True. And it was determined, well, Burlington has now grown up around it. Let Burlington pay for it. We'll retain ownership. But Burlington really wants this park, needs this park, and is willing to maintain the park. I wonder how many millions of dollars we've saved since 1983 to now. And so in balance, as you say, it's good to have the conversation because that property is worth a lot of dollars. It is, Doug, and, and, I, and thank you for the history lesson accurately as you've conveyed and shared and, and uh, absolutely the city of Burlington, to their credit, has looked after all operating costs all these years. Well, uh, we also had uh, a major storm that dominated over the last couple of days, and the scenes from New Jersey and New York, Horrendous. our hearts go out to those, uh, those folks. 
Uh, the cost of cleanup is going to be horrendous uh, for um, the states of New York and even into West Virginia. At one point uh, on Tuesday, eight inches of snow had fallen. <laughs> Unbelievable for this time of the Just year. Just complicate things how, terribly. How did we make out? I know we had some power shortages in, in Dundas and there were some trees down in, in various localities, but it seems Hamilton, and you're one of the councillors who's had to deal with it, uh, we seem to avoid any major flooding issues with this storm. Doug, we did. Thank God, uh, the last 72 hours, I'm very happy from our, our proximity of our city and region to the storm Sandy that came off the U.S. Uh, east seaboard. Uh, I'm so thankful to God. Uh, it literally bypassed us, and we mm -hmm. got some rain accumulation and showers, some high winds uh, two days ago. But all things considered, count our blessings. Our public works crews deserve so much credit. They got ahead of the storm. Uh, they went across the city cleaning out catch basins of this time of year where the leaves have fallen in great numbers and great volumes. And so any kind of plugging up of the system, of course, can lead to overflow. And uh, so they were out there proactively, very proud of them. Emergency services crews were on standby just in case. Uh, Horizon Utilities deserves tremendous credit. We got little pockets in the outlying areas. Hydro One still looks after, but from most of the city of Hamilton, Horizon Utilities uh, were on the scene. I know I had a couple of pockets up in my ward of uh, power outages along Crockett Street and along Elmhurst in the last 48 hours, and within a matter of 24 hours, if not less time, uh, power was restored. So all things considered, we did. Uh, we we came through this uh, much better than had been predicted. And this is one where I'm glad the weather people locally were uh, were wrong on the forecast <laughs> on this one. It had the potential to cost the city of Hamilton a lot of money. Uh, we have a 3P fund, and yes. you'll explain that for folks what that is. But basically, it's a, it's a plumbing fund yes. uh, to make sure people have the right equipment, especially if they're flood prone. And I know right across the mountain, you and Councillors Duvall and Whitehead, and below the mountain as well, there are pockets in this city where the infrastructure is old, the water backs up very quickly, and, and you've already tapped out that fund. You beefed it up once, I'm talking about council beefing up the fund once, it's tapped out again, and yet it seems to me there's a general consensus <coughs> on council that this is a priority, and yet KPMG, who is uh, consulting with the city on, on budget areas, right. is recommending don't top that one up. In fact, you might want to look at getting rid of that program. Is that going to sink or swim with this council? So let's put KPMG aside for now because uh, we just got the report from them the other day on all but 135 services and programs across our city and what the corporation provides. Let's put them aside for a moment, Doug. So it's the protective plumbing program that council implemented about three years ago after the, um, the terrible flood on July 26 of 2009, about 7,000 homes across our city. Now, there were big floods before that. Yeah. I think going back to 04 and 05 in the east end of the city, West Mountain got a bad a year or two after that. But going back as recently as July 26, 2009, well, we've, we had the compassionate grant to cover off uh, insurance deductibles for our homeowners up to $1,000 per flood per homeowner. But this protective plumbing program came in the last three years offering $2,000 grant from the city. Uh, our professional staff told us that the estimates that they got to implement this program on average per home to install the backflow valve in basements was on average about $2,000. So we settled in on that amount. Um, after, ironically, after the flood of July 26, 2009, and the one a month later on August 29, 2009, not quite as many homes at that time in late August. But ironically, after those two floods, there are over 7,000 homes. Only about a third of those homeowners since then to now uh, took up the city on its program to say, yeah, I'd like to get one of those valves installed. I've mm -hmm. been a flood victim. Uh, hopefully if I can prevent that from happening, if this is a measure to do it, I'll take the city up on their offer. But since we changed the policy in the last nine months to say that even if you're not a flood victim, Doug, if you want to proactively, preventatively tap into this program, we're going to make it available to you. 
Doug, I'm slow to this climate change stuff and that. Suzuki was preaching this stuff probably 30 years ago. I'm catching up to it and everything. There's obviously something to it. And so, look, from my standpoint, and not speaking for my colleagues, but even today with a presentation at our workshop and an update on this program and needing to increase the funding to get us through this year again, I can tell you the overwhelming sentiment was continue the program. This is the kind of thing for me, Doug, that our taxpayers, from an infrastructure standpoint, come to expect from their municipal government. And if we, we need something like six to seven hundred million dollars to properly upgrade and modernize all of our infrastructure across the city, including the water wastewater treatment plan on Woodward Avenue, our old city within our municipal tax base, we can't afford that. That's a long term plan. We need help from federal provincial governments to do it properly and more uh, accelerated on a, on a plan. So this is some opportunity for the municipality to say to the homeowner, look, either if you've been a flood victim, unfortunately, here's, here's a valve a grant that we can provide for you with qualified plumbers, certified plumbers. And secondly, now, if you're not a flood victim, but think, you know what, I don't want to potentially be one, mm -hmm. I'll get the valve installed. So the overall program over three years has cost us about $10 million. Um, it's amazing now for those homeowners that have not been flood victim who have said proactively calling City Hall saying I'd like to take advantage of the program. Um, today we've just asked for another one and a half million dollars to bring it up to roughly the ten million dollars. Moving forward Doug in the 2013 budget uh, today we also passed a motion to do a full assessment review of the program. We just want to make sure there's no gouging that's going on out there by the odd unscrupulous person taking advantage of a situation. So I think that's merited in terms of just a good assessment of the program. But for me, Doug, there's other areas of the corporation we can cut back on if we want to save municipal tax dollars. This for me is one showing care and compassion from the municipality. I'm strongly a big supporter of this. And a preventative looking forward kind of idea. Absolutely don't. Not only helping people who have become victims, but allowing those who do not want the hassle of the insurance agents, the loss of, you know, perhaps loved items that they have in their basements. Right. I mean, oh, Doug, you've just, so if I might please, you've just yeah. raised a good point with the insurance companies, because I brought that up today in my comments. So many homeowners in my ward uh, showed me recently their insurance renewals. Many of them are capped now at a certain amount for sewer backup, 15, 20, 25,000. And the caveat at the bottom by the insurer is, but if you get a backflow valve installed or sump pump by the city of Hamilton, you can approach us to increase your coverage. So even the insurance companies now are encouraging. So I'm saying, hey, we got to keep the momentum of this program going to help our homeowners have existing or expanded coverage. Because you had the insurance industry before, I think it was a GIC, earlier a few in months the ago, year, you're right. Explaining because y you, especially the mountain councillors, were finding pockets of people who were being denied that kind of protection. Uh, absolutely. And so and it they was were stressful. called on the carpet to answer some questions. And the Insurance Bureau, Bureau of Canada, Doug, you're absolutely right, came in, a couple of representatives, and we said to them firmly and sternly, please, do not create any more anguish or stress upon both your clients and our citizens. And many of them, because they were caught in a particular L8 or L9 postal code and had not been a flood victim, but because it was spread widely by the insurer over a particular postal code, they said, oh, we're going to start capping your rates. I thought that was extremely unfair. But we're working with the Insurance Bureau of Canada to correct that. Now, we're going to bring the KPMG report back in. So thank and, you. And, and I know it's very, very early on, and I do not... I uh, think you guys are going to have a very fun time this year with the budget process, especially with Queen's Park in limbo, basically. True. But some of the recommendations that were put in the paper, and I hear you about some of the big departments or big ticket items, uh, surely there can be savings found there. But in the report as well, there's the basic user fee kind of nonsense that people, there was an opinion, but people are pretty much tapped out when it comes to recreational rates. Once again, Here's KPMG recommending that City of Hamilton raise recreation rates. 
I know it costs more to cut grass at Olympic Park or any other park. I know you have a schedule, but the soccer clubs and the moms and dads who want their kids to recreate can't always meet those fees. It just seems to be one of those that causes a little bit of anguish when there are bigger you know, chickens to fry. You know, Doug, I, I hesitantly and somewhat with trepidation a year ago agreed with the majority of my colleagues to go down this path of doing the service delivery review because some of these program services facilities, we've had debates on them before. I'm not even going to resurrect a couple of them before you for fear that people viewing in will go, oh no, Tom, please not again, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, but we've had council decisions. You don't want me to bring up snow <laughs> removal? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> or our two fabulous, wonderful long-term care facilities that are second to none. Yes. So I want to say that Council has made some decisions since amalgamation on some of these service delivery reviews when we did one-offs uh, to investigate them. And Council has spoken on many of them saying no, either too sensitive, too valuable, too many community ramifications, uh, unnecessary stress upon our families and staff in certain situations. Now to your rec center and recreational fees example. Doug, at a time when we're trying to promote healthier living, healthier activity, and affordability, accessibility. Nutrition, the fight on obesity. You've got it, Doug, and even with your new portfolio as well in the community with the awesome work that that organization does, I mean, for goodness sakes, increase recreation fees. Uh, people will see that as saying, Tom, I don't mind through my taxes, keeping the rec centers operating, keeping the arenas open, keeping the playgrounds and the parks looked after. Many families cannot afford getting away in the middle of summer up to some uh, resort or vacation place uh, up in the Muskokas. So for many of them, this is the, where their livelihood, where their families engage. And I've always been a strong supporter of making these uh, programs accessible and available and affordable, Doug, the three A's. So KPMG and tying back into the 3P plumbing program again on their top 10 list and with the recreational fees, I'm thinking to myself, okay, they've come back doing their homework. They've brought us back a wealth of information, but I can tell you right now, some of them will be absolutely non-starters, not just for me, but I, I believe a majority of council. All right, I want to get into Ward 6 with what's going on there, but I did raise the idea that Councillor Marula is floating around of naming rights. Very quickly, is this something we need to investigate? I mean, Sam, Councillor Marula suggesting naming rights on just about anything that the citizens of Hamilton own. Doug, Good we idea. Gotta, Doug, we got to tread carefully on that. Um, you know, I don't even want to repeat what the mountain community went through a few over the last few years. And we've now got a glorious, beautiful hospital. And great thanks to one of our greatest philanthropists, uh, the Jurabinsky family. I, I want to avoid, if we can, that kind of situation in the future. I thought with Hamilton Place about 10 years ago, I thought the former HEC 5 board, I thought that was a model of how to do an appropriate blended name. The Ronald V. Joyce Center for the Performing Arts at Hamilton Place, I thought wonderful. That acknowledges the great Tim Hortons founder, co-founder with his, I think it was at that time, $5 million contribution while acknowledging and retaining the existing historic name that the community came up with mm -hmm. about 35 years ago for Hamilton Place. There's got to be ways of doing it. The Tiger Cats, of course, with the new Iverwind Stadium, there's going to be one there that everyone's going to be watching closely. We want the Cats to raise more money. Uh, some of it's going to go towards a community-type fund as well that will help the precinct in Councillor Morelli's ward. We just got to handle these carefully. Now, one that Councillor Marula brought up that I seconded his motion from 10 years ago, but sadly didn't gain any traction, Doug, was to do some kind of vegetation advertisement along the Lincoln Alexander Parkway and maybe down the Red Hill Valley Parkway, similar to the Gardner Expressway and Lakeshore Boulevard in Toronto, where you see all those companies with the vegetation along there. It's brought in millions of dollars. We've resurrected Which that. Which billions of people see. Absolutely. That, and that could actually pretty and tidy up some of the long grass and that that once in a while we see along the link in the Red Hill Valley Parkway. So there's opportunities, but I think we've got to handle it carefully. 
On the mountain, uh, the spectator did a survey, a, a poll, asked a question, basically, do you want a casino in Hamilton or not? And setting aside Flamborough, where there already is uh, a gambling center, uh, and the numbers came back for the spectator poll, and I think uh, from the quotes I saw from you and Councillors Duvall and Whitehead, that this is an Obama-Romney thing. It's, it's dead even. It's 50-50 on this question of a casino, presumably in downtown. So, yes, Doug, that seems to be so far, which confirms both um, other polls that have been done individually and it confirms somewhat anecdotally what I've been getting as well, traveling in my ward, people stopping me at the mall, the gas bar, whatever, offer, offering their opinion. Interesting on the 50-50, uh, from the referendum of 97, which I was around for, the former city of Hamilton alone, uh, was about a two-thirds against a casino, uh, which I honored after being re-elected. I'm just curious that if the what seems to be consistent numbers right now of 50-50 hold, I'm, I'm wondering if that's indicative of the fact over 15 years the opposition to a casino has dwindled from two-thirds to 50-50. That's a curiosity for me that I've kind of zeroed in on, taken note of. Secondly, you know Council's position, Doug, has been constantly and still is supporting Flamborough Downs. Might I just digress for a moment to say to you, a mutual friend of mine. Well, with, you went on a recent tour. I went on a recent tour in eye the last opener week. For you? An eye opener for me up in the Flamborough area through a mutual friend who knew a mutual farmer up there, somebody who's very influential up there, spent four hours with them, took me on a tour of the horse racing industry in Flamborough. Doug, it was not only an eye opener, but I'll tell you the average urbanite in Hamilton knows of horse racing and farms in Flamborough area, knows there's a casino slots with the track, but I'll bet you the average person, including me before I went, won't, wouldn't have a clue of the magnitude and the degree of these multi-acre farms with multi-hundreds of people employed from grooming, breeding, training, exercising, feeding. I was truly overwhelmed by the size of the operations out there. So we're still very supportive. We're hoping some way, somehow, OLG, Province of Ontario, although prorogued, can find their way to support Flamborough. Or maybe, Doug, I've said to some people through the proroguing, maybe, Maybe does that buy us as a municipality some additional time to keep Flamborough in play? We've heard recently that either Toronto and or Kingston have been given extensions till maybe the spring of next year to make up a casino decision. But back to your original point, um, with the subcommittee that the mayor proposed, that council supported, five of my colleagues that are on it, they're going to do their own consultative survey and polling. And if we're going to have a town hall meeting, Councillors Duval, Whitehead and I have talked about it as the mountain reps, we'll either do one big one across the mountain or we may each host a smaller one in our individual wards. And of course timing will, uh, will be a big thing whether or not we can. Let's get into uh, Ward 6. What's going on? You've got some work going on along the mountain brow, I take it. So there's, I've got a public meeting, Doug, coming up on November 12th, 6 p.m. at Sherwood uh, Secondary School in the cafeteria. The mountain brow residents from the top of the Kenilworth Loop to Mohawk Road, where the Quad Pad Arena is, will have received a direct letter from me by now, inviting them to the meeting. Staff are proposing, most importantly, a modernization, an upgrade of the road. It might require some redesigning of the road, uh, shoulder improvement, of the road and a, a pathway on, which I support on mm. the escarpment. I want to repeat on the escarpment side of Mountain Brow Boulevard where the East Mountain stairs are over to Mohawk Road and maybe some nice attractive curbing consistently curbing all the way up to Mohawk Road. So I've got a public meeting for that. Also I'm sending out letters in the next month. Because that's an old road. It, it is. It's almost that's like a, a country road. Yeah I was it? just going to say you're yeah. right Doug. Almost like a rural type road. But the Mountain Brow residents many families have been somewhat generational living there and uh, there's a lot of continuity there and they're very protective of a unique setting and a unique environment maybe would only be duplicated on scenic drive from possibly Upper Paradise to Upper Horning yes. with those kind of oversized lots and things like that. So that's number one. Number two, and I've secured the dollars to do those improvements. By the way, I'll have police and bylaw there as well because uh, there's been talk of some speeding along the brow 
and also some uh, some traffic issues as well in terms of whether or not three-way stops uh, might be required or supported by the community. What's the date for that? November 12th, uh, 6 p.m. at Sherwood Secondary School in the cafeteria. Uh, secondly, I'm proud to say that through council support, I've gotten some infrastructure dollars for Mountain Park Avenue. So that's that escarpment road from the Henderson uh, Jervinsky Hospital all the way over to Mountain Drive Park at Upper Gage. Talk about a roller coaster of a road. So badly in need of, of reconstruction, Doug, water main sewer, roads, sidewalks, everything. It was supposed to be done this year. The bridge over the Sherman Cut in light of falling rock earlier this year along the Claremont Sherman Cut, a professional staff from Capital Roads Planning said, Councillor, we'd love to include the bridge with the road reconstruction. So money's in the budget to be done next year once spring hits. And as well, Broker Drive. Broker Drive yes. from Upper Ottawa to the Brow. I've got money approved in the budget as well. I was hoping to get that started this year. Road, sidewalk reconstruction as well, water sewer main upgrades just too big of a project fear was if winter came we didn't get it complete in time didn't want that entire road exposed during the winter time so those are three major infrastructure projects that I'm proud to say dollars have been secured to move on with and I believe the last sunny day that we saw was the day my wife and I walked along that from upper Wentworth along the brow over to uh, Mountain Boulevard Park so Yes. And I, I can see the work that's in play. It's, it's a beautiful part of our city. It really thank is. you, Councillor Tom Jackson. Doug, thank you so much. It's been a great time to be back with you. That's the Council Edition for Wednesday, October 31st. If you're driving this evening, watch out for the little ones. And everyone, please enjoy. We return in two weeks with Ward 10 Councillor Maria Pearson. I'm Doug Faraway. Thank you for watching.